and good morning to you again. Our, our theme throughout Advent and Christmas has been the characters of Christmas. And in our series so far, we've been looking at the various characters in the Christmas story to see what we can learn from them. We've looked at the prophets who predicted the birth of the Messiah. We looked at Mary, the poor peasant girl who became the mother of the Son of God. Joseph, her betrothed, the shepherds, who were the first to hear the news of the birth of Christ, and the Magi, who came from a foreign country to acknowledge the birth of the King of the Jews. Today we finish this series with a look at two minor characters who are often forgotten and a scene in the story that is often ignored. They are the confirming voices who quietly and subtly tie together the threads that complete the picture of the revelation to be unveiled and given to the world. Someone might ask, why are we still talking about Christmas? It's been two weeks since Christmas Day. It's time to move on. Well, the reason goes back to these biblical accounts of the birth of Christ and also to the history of the church's celebration of the nativity and to one of the most important biblical themes in the nativity stories. In fact, the reason for continuing to talk about Christmas and these characters goes back to the one of the, the key reasons the Gospels were written in the very f- first place. Now, I'm not suggesting that we drag our Christmas celebration out for weeks on end. You're, you're not going to get any votes from me for three more months of Hallmark Christmas movies. But there's a very important part at the end of the story to which we need to give some attention. And so before we do that, though, let's start with a dip into church history. In the latter half of the fourth century, Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire. Persecution of the church by the imperial government, for the most part, had ended. And Christianity was rapidly becoming the dominant faith in the empire. The celebration of Christian holy days was becoming formalized. And the three primary feast days were Easter and Christmas and Epiphany, which was also known in some places as the Feast of the Three Kings. And the date for Epiphany was January 6th, 12 days after Christmas, which is why in some parts of the world, or in some families, Christians celebrate Christmas as a a 12-day holiday season rather than as a single day. In any case, these two holidays, Christmas and Epiphany, were joined together, with Christmas marking the day of the birth of Christ and Epiphany marking the day when Christ was revealed to the Magi. That word revealed is important. The term epiphany comes from the Greek verb epiphino, which means appear, to give light, to reveal. Our text this morning includes two very similar expressions that point to this idea of God revealing something. In Luke chapter 2, verse 30, Simeon declares, My eyes have seen your salvation. God's salvation has been revealed to him in the person of this child in his parents' arms in the temple. Simeon then goes on to say that this same child will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And the Greek word there for revelation is apokalypsis, an unveiling. The verbal form apokalypto is synonymous with epiphino, so there's this merging of ideas here. So Christmas marked the day of the coming of Christ, but epiphany marked the day that he was revealed as the Savior of the nations which is why it is generally associated with the coming of the Magi. As I pointed out last week, the Magi are significant primarily because of what they represent, the coming of the Gentile nations to the Jewish Messiah. So this year, we could have ended our Christmas series last week and simply pointed out, hey, January 6th is going to be Epiphany. Could have mentioned the connection of the Magi and been done with it. But since we're only two days past Epiphany, It gives us a chance to look more carefully at what this revelation of God involves. And since the Magi are a key aspect of this revelation, we've included them at points in our service today in the music you've heard. To help us see how these two sets of characters fit with the celebration of Epiphany, both the Magi and these two characters. So let's look now at our passage. First, notice that Luke is very careful in his account to point out the faithfulness of Joseph and Mary to keep the requirements of the Mosaic law. First of all, they circumcised Jesus on the eighth day after his birth in accordance with the law to show that he is a member of the people of Israel, a partaker of the covenant with Yahweh. Leviticus Leviticus 12.3 is 
That's where they find that commandment. Secondly, they came to the temple to offer the sacrifice for purification after the birth of a child, which was 40 days after birth in the case of a male infant. As was customary, they brought Jesus with them to verify his birth and his circumcision. Leviticus 12.4. And third, they offered the prescribed offering for purification according to the law, two doves or two young pigeons. Leviticus 12.6-8. Uh, just by the way, this sacrifice is how we know that Joseph and Mary were very poor. It is the smallest and cheapest sacrifice that's allowed for purification and was only for those who could not afford a lamb. And finally, just to make sure his readers didn't miss the point, Luke closes this portion of the narrative by noting that Mary and Joseph returned to their home village of Nazareth after they had done everything required by the law of the Lord. Now, this is not unusual for Luke. He's pointed out similar things with similar emphasis in the first part of his birth narrative. In chapter 1, both Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, are described as righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Well, why would Luke go to such lengths to make this important point? It has to do with his message and with his audience. Luke is writing for people who are either Jewish or are sympathetic to Judaism, for whom adherence to the Mosaic law is the primary sign of fidelity to God, so they care very deeply about righteousness, which is measured by, have you been keeping the commandments? And Luke's message claims to be the word of God, the fulfillment of the prophetic promises of the Hebrew scriptures. So those who proclaim this word, therefore, must demonstrate that what they say is consistent with what God has said in the holy writings of the law and the prophets. For Luke's message to be credible, to have credence with, the, with his audience, it had to be attested by those who clearly speak for the God of Israel. Second, this passage focuses on Jesus as the firstborn. Luke is pointing out not only that Mary and Joseph fulfilled what the law required by bringing a sacrifice for purification, he's showing that Jesus fulfilled that which the law and the entire sacrificial system prefigured. Jesus was not just any firstborn male. He was the firstborn son of God. As such, he is the heir of all that belonged to God. All of creation was his inheritance over which he would rightly rule. And according to Mosaic law, every firstborn male belonged to God. Exodus 13, verses 1 and 2. The firstborn males of the flock are offered as a sacrifice, but the firstborn male children were consecrated to God by the sacrifice of a substitute. So as a firstborn male, Jesus symbolized what it meant to be consecrated, devoted to God's service. His life was to be given in service to God. Well, the reason that God claimed those firstborn males has to do with the tenth plague when he delivered Israel from Egypt. The tenth plague was what? It was the death of all the firstborn males in Egypt. But the firstborn males of the Jews were spared. God passed over their homes, which were marked with the blood of the sacrificial lamb, and left them alive. Having been spared... These firstborn then were now to be regarded as belonging to God. So the symbolism of the firstborn is especially rich here. Jesus belongs to God by virtue of the fact that he's the son of God. He also belongs to God by virtue of the fact that he's been consecrated to God, that his life is being given completely into the service of God, and he will complete that service to God by giving his life as a sacrifice, the ultimate Passover lamb, fulfilling all that the sacrificial system typified. The third thing this passage, uh, we want to note about it, it features these two characters. Admittedly, very minor characters in the story, but they play a very big role in that story. Three important points I'd like you to note in this passage that tell us about the significance of these characters and why they're important to the story. First of all, they are prophets 
who confirmed the earlier words from the angel about the identity and the destiny of the child Jesus. We first meet Simeon. Like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph, he is described as righteous and devout. That is, he's obedient to the law, he's faithful to God. And then in very short order, Luke mentions three times that Simeon is someone on whom the Holy Spirit resides. He says, first of all, the Holy Spirit is on him. That's Luke's typical language for referring to the prophetic anointing. He says that the Holy Spirit has spoken to him and communicated a message to him, another indication that Simeon has the prophetic gifting. And then he says he was impressed and guided by the Holy Spirit to come to the temple this day. Again, an indication that Simeon is inspired as a prophet. Luke is piling up Simeon's credentials as a prophetic voice who can confirm what the angel told Mary. Likewise, Anna, this widow who's been constantly in the temple courts for over 60 years, is called a prophet. Our NIV reads, there was also a prophet, Anna. And that needs to be understood to mean there was also another prophet in addition to Simon, Anna. Not, there was another person who was there, she happened to be a prophet. And Luke similarly highlights her devotion to God. She's constantly in the temple coats. It's the most sacred place in Jewish thought. She's constantly worshiping God through her prayer and fasting. Luke doesn't quote anything that she says, but he notes that she is confirming to all who are around that Jesus is this one who fulfills the prophecies about the consolation of Jerusalem. Secondly, these two provide two independent witnesses who attest to the claim that the child is the promised Messiah who has come to save his people. Luke again is holding fast to the scriptures. He's adding layer upon layer of attestation from the law. Because according to Deuteronomy 19.15, a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So he provides us with two more witnesses, a man and a woman, which is typical for Luke, and they offer prophetic affirmation of what God had done. And then thirdly, they link this child to the ancient prophecies concerning the salvation of Israel from the oppression of the nations and the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon is described as waiting for the consolation of Israel. And Anna speaks about the child to those who around her, like herself, are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Both of these phrases, waiting for the consolation of Israel and waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem, those echo specific expressions from the prophets, notably from Isaiah, and these occur in prophecies related to the salvation of Israel or of Judah that will occur after the nation has been taken into exile as judgment for their sins. And each of these two old prophets, Simeon and Anna, were waiting in Jerusalem for something that had been promised more than 700 years earlier. Between the time that those prophecies had first been announced and then committed to writing and stored away and the time when Simeon and Anna were in the temple, the nation of Israel had lived in nearly continual oppression, ruled by foreigners who cared very little or nothing for their religion or their customs, some of whom actually tried to eliminate Jewish religion and substitute their own religion and its idols in place of Judaism. There were many Jews that capitulated to those pressures, but others, like Anna and Simeon, waited and prayed. But what exactly were they waiting for? For that, let's turn our attention to the book of Isaiah for just a few moments. There is a section in Isaiah, beginning in chapter 40, continuing on to the end of the book, that is particularly focused on God's promise to restore the nation after its captivity in Babylon. I'm going to just pull out the most obvious and pertinent verses from this section to show you what Anna and Simeon must have had firmly in their minds and in their prayers, what they were waiting for and what they were believing God to fulfill. So chapter 40 begins with the famous announcement of God's declaration through the prophet to the people. Comfort, 
Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here begins the announcement of God's salvation to be brought to the exiles in Babylon. A way of salvation, a way of restoration is coming, and it is something that all people will see. A tantalizing hint that's going to play out later. Then comes the introduction of a particularly mysterious character, the servant of Yahweh, Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Not only is God going to restore his people to their land through this servant and free them from their oppressors, he's going to make him to be a light to the Gentiles, to those who have been the oppressors of his people, the idolatrous nations who don't know him, so that his salvation will be known throughout the earth. Isaiah 51, 1-8 continues this theme. Here's verse 4 with its echo of this phrase, a light to the nations. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. In the context of chapter 51, this light to the nations is the knowledge of the righteousness of God, of living in accordance with God's ways. But the connection to the previous passage shows that it is through the servant that God's instruction will go forth. It's going to result in the salvation of the nation. Next, Isaiah 52, verses 9 and 10. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. There's that echo. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Here we see God's promise that he will show his salvation to all the ends of the earth when he redeems Jerusalem. The city that was destroyed by the Babylonians will be rebuilt by the returning exiles. And yet, Isaiah hints that there is more to come. For all nations still need to see the salvation, not just those who are in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Isaiah 55, 3-5, God pleads with his people to come to him and promises that he will make with them a covenant, implying something new, since they are already in a covenant with him, though they've broken that covenant. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him, that is David, a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. A covenant connected to a promise to David. Surely that must be the Messiah. And nations coming to the Holy One of Israel, the God of Israel, the only Savior. Hmm. Isaiah 59, 19 and 20 tells us, From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere His glory. For He will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. The Redeemer in Zion. It's another name for Jerusalem, symbol of the restored people of Israel who are living in the place of the presence of God. And when the Redeemer is there, people from the west and the east will worship Him as people from the uttermost ends of the earth. Two more. Isaiah 60, 1-3. To the restored remnant in Israel, the people of Zion, God says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, 
and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Nations, nations in darkness, coming to the light that is upon the people of God, those who have been redeemed, to whom God has sent his salvation. The Lord himself rises upon you, for he is your light, a light that reveals salvation to the nations, the peoples who are in darkness. And finally, in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 11, we have a powerful declaration of what it is that the servant of Yahweh says God has anointed him to do. Jesus quoted the first part of this chapter when he announced his mission to the people in the synagogue in Nazareth. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I just want you to note this. After speaking about comforting those who are mourning, giving beauty in place of ashes, and so on, after speaking of the restoration of Zion, after promising that God will clothe them with salvation, the prophet says this, For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. All nations. Not just Israel. Not just Jerusalem. All nations. All these passages from Isaiah tie together two crucial pieces of this Christmas prophetic puzzle. The first is this. God is sending salvation to his people through a Messiah. And the first piece of that puzzle is what Simeon and Anna and others were waiting for. The coming of the one who would bring God's full and final redemption of his people. Not just returning from exile. They were already there in Jerusalem. But they needed to be delivered from the oppression of the nations because they were still being ruled over by an oppressive foreign power. What they did not realize, even though it was laced throughout Isaiah's prophecies and elsewhere, was that there was a second piece that was inseparably connected to the promise of the redemption of Jerusalem, and that was this, that the Messiah is going to send salvation to the peoples of the world, the nations, all the nations, all the people groups, the non-Jewish tribes of the world, the goyim, the ethnos, they will see the light of God's truth. The union of these two pieces is the revelation of what was hidden in plain sight, the mystery that was waiting to be opened, promise that was veiled, even from the comprehension of the prophets themselves, but now was being unveiled. And Luke places this smack in the front of his gospel with this key passage about two minor characters, two old prophets to whom few paid any attention, even in their own day. But Luke wants every one of his readers to understand the truth, that God's salvation has been sent to the world through the gospel, beginning with the story of how he was born, complete with all of the attestation from Scripture and the confirmation of prophetic voices which combine to give a resounding affirmation of the truthfulness of the message of the gospel. Now, to be fair, Matthew does the same thing, though a little less obviously. Because, again, he's written about the Magi. The Magi symbolize what Luke points out more concretely. The Jewish Messiah is not just the king of the Jews. He is the king of the whole world the king of the universe, before whom all must bow. The Christmas story, from beginning to end, is not just a fun tale about a miraculous birth of a baby. It's not an inspiring story meant to encourage us to have hope because things will be better if we can just come together and try to live in peace. The Christmas story is the opening volley in a battle. It is the shot across the bow, the declaration of war upon evil. It is the thunderclap of a royal proclamation that the king has come, bringing salvation from sin and from our own stupid, self-centered living that has destroyed what God has made. It is the message to the world that light has conquered darkness because God has revealed himself to us. Our king has come. He's the promised one. He's the Messiah of Israel and the Lord of all, and it's time to bow. It's time to surrender. And it's time to tell everyone else what has happened. That's why Epiphany matters. Because Epiphany completes Christmas. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to celebrate January 6th every year. But what Epiphany stands for, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Savior of the Gentile nations whose word is to go out to all the world. That needs to be kept alive and celebrated in our churches and in our homes and in our lives every day of every year until he comes again. That's why epiphany matters.